Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll begin. Uh, welcome to our social network analysis uh, webinar, where we cover the fundamental concepts of this uh, methodology. Um, I'm Dermot MacDonald. I'm a research associate here at the UK Data Service uh, in the University of Manchester. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Alice uh, Bloom, uh, who's listening in and will be keeping an eye uh, on things for us. Um, uh, let's uh, get going. So today we'll uh, cover social network analysis. So we're going to set the, um, the building blocks for allowing us to manipulate and analyze data. Um, there will be a little bit of analysis and a little bit of a coding demonstration near the end. Uh, so that's quite good. Uh, but mainly we'll focus on defining and clarifying some of the key concepts and terms um, associated with social network um, analysis. So we look at some of the key concepts. Um, we'll have a look at how networks are represented in data form, um, how are they actually stored, how do we actually visualize network data. Um, that area is actually really interesting and quite distinctive uh, from what you're um, used to. Excellent. So to give you the why, so why are you actually here for this training series, uh, and this one in particular, I quite like this quote by Scott. Um, which many who have seen the potential offered by network analysis have found it difficult to come to grips with the highly technical and mathematical language that necessarily characterizes much of the discussion in the technical uh, literature. I'm sure maybe some of you have come across social network analysis before, social networks. You may have seen some of the terminology, transitivity, assortativity, nodes, ties, edges, arcs, vertices. There's a lot of technical um, abstract language and terms that are used. So today in particular, and this entire training series is about demystifying all of these technical abstract terms and translating it into very practical applied uh, knowledge that you can use in your social uh, research. So that's what you need to uh, hold me uh, to account for. So I said that a lot of you will probably be aware of social networks and how they look and how they're visualized. Um, even in the fictional social world, uh, social networks um, are a feature. I'm not much or any bit of a Star Wars fan, but I think this is quite a good um, example. Um, here we've got a social network uh, of characters uh, in the first six movies, I think, um, not the newer ones. So each of these circles represents some of the characters, and these characters are joined um, by lines. And these lines exist if two characters speak in the same. Uh, so you can see that there's definitely a line between Luke and Chewbacca, and it's quite a thick line, which means that Luke and Chewbacca spoke, I don't know, but spoke in quite a lot of the same scenes together uh, and to each other uh, as well. And you can kind of see on the, the outer, the periphery of the social network that there's lots of characters who are not really worth naming and are only connected to you know one other character, um, et cetera. So even in such a trivial example, and apologies, Star Wars fans, um, we can see some of the core features uh, of social networks. We can see that there are entities that form the network, and then there are patterns in the connections between these entities um, also. So for the rest of this, we're gonna use some uh, real data, uh, some real social networks, but we're also gonna explore um, many of the same concepts that apply to fictional, real social networks, um, you name it. So let's go through uh, some of the key um, aspects of social network um, analysis. So what is it? So how would we uh, define it? So it's, a, it's essentially a methodology. It's quite a broad, rich uh, methodology. Um, it's best described as a toolbox. I quite like that. Um, it's a very practical methodology. It allows you to measure and describe and to analyze patterns uh, in social structures. So basically, if we think of the way in which individuals are embedded in societies or embedded in organizations, embedded in events, um, we can analyze those connections between people to other people, people to those organizations, and as a result, to other organizations. So if we think of the um, social world as um, a network of connections, uh, then we can apply social network analysis uh, and the measures and algorithms and the methods that it, it provides to understand these patterns. Um, a relation is a distinctive type of connection or a tie between two um, entities. A very simple example we can all think of is a familial uh, relation. So 
a brother and sister share a sibling relation, um, cousins share um, a cousin relation, um, friends, uh, a friendship tie, uh, colleagues, a collegial relation, um, etc. So if you hear relation, think of a type of connection or tie that exists um, between two entities. And then it's these relations that constitute the building blocks um, of networks. So if we're if networks are cons constituted of relations between entities, social network analysis concerns itself with the analysis of those relations and the patterns that form um, between uh, our units of analysis. So why should you uh, consider SNA? Um, it's, a, it's not quite um, text mining or it's not quite web scraping in that it's not the most popular zeitgeisty uh, method uh, out there, but it is increasingly um, popular. It has a long running history in the social sciences going back to the 1920s, 1930s. But why should you consider it for your research um, right now? Those of you who are quantitative um, researchers uh, will recognize this incredibly sim uh, simple statistical model. So we have an outcome here, which we call Y. Uh, and we can explain or predict Y using an initial guess, an explanatory factor, and a little term that captures the fact that we can't perfectly predict an outcome. There's always random luck or random uh, chance. But in essence, we've got an outcome, something we're interested in explaining, and we've got some kind of factor or we've got some kind of variable that we think explains that outcome. So how does this apply to social network analysis? Well, uh, maybe the social network is the thing or the phenomenon that you are trying to uh, describe and explain. So it's your Y variable um, in the framework that I've just um, outlined. So for example, uh, you might be interested in uh, political networks on Twitter. Uh, so there may be different Twitter accounts that tweet certain political messages on Twitter uh, and they retweet um, other accounts and all that Twitter activity forms a network. So the thing itself is a network. You're not trying to coerce it to fit a network structure. Um, if you're a social scientist interested in urban planning, for example, you might be interested in the London Underground network. That is literally a network of train stations and rail lines, uh, for example. Uh, COVID-19, uh, which of course uh, we do need to mention to some extent, um, we see with kids going back to school that they're forming bubbles, so kind of units of kids that can't really interact with other year groups. So now schooling has become a network. So who you interact with, which teachers, which pupils, they form individual networks uh, which sit within an individual school, which sits within you know, a local authority. So lots of social phenomena nowadays are just networks. They're defined as networks and they operate um, as networks. From another perspective, um, maybe it's features and properties of social networks. Um, that you're interested in. And if you know how well somebody is connected within a network, that then helps you explain a Y variable. So it helps you explain um, an outcome. So there was a, about 12 years ago, um, there was a really interesting literature review uh, done by some public health scholars, uh, I think at Harvard. Um, and they were looking at the impact of a person's social network on um, a range of health outcomes, mental health, physical health um, outcomes. And they concluded that it is uh, vitally important, you know, how, how well connected somebody is, how isolated somebody is uh, to a range of health outcomes. Now that sounds very obvious if we talk about mental health, if you have a wider network of friends, maybe you're more active, more stimulation, and you have better mental health outcomes. But they even found um, that your social network um, characteristics actually predicted um, the spread of biological um, health, negative health outcomes. So obviously very obvious things like catching diseases, but there were actually you know, physical um, negative outcomes that arose uh, from people's um, social network characteristics. So if someone was particularly isolated, um, that tended to be linked with really poor physical and mental health um, outcomes. So I've gone on about that, but it was a really fascinating study about 12 years ago, and I just couldn't believe how important, you know, some aspects of a person's social network was for their physical health. It was just um, incredible. And and the the uh, co-authors, you know, summarize it here that are in an enormous range 
of physical and mental health um, issues um, are really linked to the number of connections a person has and the size of their social um, network. So that was fascinating. So why SNA? Maybe you have something that is a network and you want the appropriate tools to analyze it, or maybe you've got an outcome and you think it's important to know how well connected somebody is, and therefore you need measures and calculations that tell you something about a person's social network, and you can use those variables and factors to explain uh, something else. So when should you use it? Um, so I'm not really talking temporally here, I'm talking about identifying the opportunity uh, and the appropriate conditions to use it. So very simply, if you are dealing with relational data, um, social network analysis is appropriate. What do we mean by that? So we just mean data or a data set that captures relationships and connections between your units of analysis. So your units of analysis are just the things and the entities that you're interested in analyzing. So for me, I'm a charity researcher. The units of analysis in my studies tend to be individual organizations. Um, they'll be the people you interview. They'll be the communities you do some ethnography in, et cetera. So if you, you want information, on how your units of analysis are connected and related. So this is in contrast to what most of us are used to, which is attributional data. So you've got units of analysis, and then you capture characteristics, demographics about those units um, of analysis. So let's take a quick look, a uh, very simple fictional example. Here we have some attributional data. Our units of analysis are individuals, so we have five here. And then we capture information on their attributes, their sex, their age, their employment um, status. If we had relational data on the same units of analysis, this is what our data set would look like. So we can see here, we still have the same units of analysis. Every row is a person, but now every column is a person also. And the values uh, for each column and row um, tell us how these people are connected. So John and Joan are friends. John and Jenny are colleagues, and John doesn't know Juliet or Jack. Um, and you can read down the way or across the way. Um, it doesn't matter in this particular example. But you can see how the data structure, um, so we're talking about two spreadsheets here, if that's how you want to think about it. Um, but the type of information we're collecting is different. On the top left, attributional data. On the bottom right, um, relational data. And in the next webinar, um, I'll show you how to convert this top left one to this bottom uh, right. And finally, what are the typical kind of steps in a social network um, analysis? So what you typically tend to do is you try to identify and visualize patterns of relations between units um, of analysis. So like our, our very silly Star Wars example earlier, um, that's kind of a, a thing you could do and typically do do uh, in a social network analysis. Uh, you also want to examine the structural properties and characteristics of these relations. Uh, by this, I mean you're interested in measures of how well connected somebody is in a network. You're interested in how many strong ties there are in a network versus how many weak ties there are in a network, um, and so on. Lots of different measures capturing the patterns and the relations uh, in a social network. And then, as I said, you might want to take some of these measures. So you want to you know, describe your network, and are some of these network characteristics associated with outcomes experienced by your units of analysis? Um, so we'll go through an example later where we look at how charities are connected to each other. Are the best connected charities, you know, the, the ones that raise the most money from uh, the public, for example? These are questions we can begin uh, to ask with some social network uh, data. So as a result of all this, so mainly if we have relational data instead of attributional data. Um, then SNA requires distinctive data structures, methods of analysis, and data visualization um, techniques. So th this is going back to why we're doing this um, training series is that some of the data may look familiar, some of the visualizations may look familiar, um, but the way you organize your data, the way you analyze it, and the way you visualize it um, are quite distinctive, uh, and there's new terms, abstract concepts, and um, that require um, some explanation. And how do we implement it? So just a very basic framework for doing this type of social network analysis. We always begin with a, a carefully articulated research question, and that research question either focuses on 
explaining a social network uh, for its own purposes. So again, it's the thing we're trying to explain, or we want to understand the social network so we can use that understanding to predict or explain um, something else. So then we want to say, okay, we want some network data, <clears throat> Um, what units of analysis and what types of relations are we interested in? So who is connected in the network and which relationships um, matter? Because people uh, are connected to each other in multiple ways. Uh, <clears throat> if you and I work together, we may also be friends. We may have gone to the same university. Our spouses may be friends, etc. So we can be connected in multiple ways. Um, so at the beginning, you think, who are we interested in and how are they connected? Knowing that, we want to find or we want to create a data set um, that provides this relational information um, on the units uh, of analysis. As I say, we've got you know lots of social networks that are opening up their data, Twitter in particular, Instagram and Facebook have tightened up a wee bit. Um, Spotify is a good one that provides lots of open access uh, data. It's really, really good. Um, so then we, we need to collect some data. And then finally, we want to summarize the network and its key features. So how big is the network? How dense it is? Is it how cohesive? Um, are there holes in the network? Are there certain people playing certain roles? Social network analysis just provides a plethora of methods and measures, which you'll see uh, over the next two webinars. It's crazy. You can, If there's something you can think of analyzing about a network, uh, there is a method and there is some Python code that allows you uh, to do that. <clears throat> so let's now uh, define some of our key concepts and get these locked in uh, in our heads. So if you were only to take away one single slide in your head uh, from this session, um, it would be this one. So a network, whether we're talking about a social, physical, biological network, whatever it is you can think of, an information network, it's constructed from two main building blocks. There are the entities that are or could be connected in a network. So these are the things, the people, the countries, the events, the computers, the train stations, whatever. These are the things that can be connected. And then there are the connections that exist or could exist um, between these entities. So you'll notice I've put in the qualifier entities that are or could be connected and connections that could exist. Um, and that's important to make that distinction. We're not just interested in all the people who are connected, but we're also obviously interested in the people in a network who are on their own, but who could potentially be connected to others uh, through the network. So then a network really is an aggregation or it's a collection of all these entities and the connections that exist um, between them. So for example, a family tree uh, is a network, very simple one. It contains individuals, um, though maybe if you're that type of person, your, your dog is included in the family tree, that's up to you. And these individuals are related through some type of familial tie. So there's some connection that joins uh, these people uh, together. Uh, so this is something I found on the BBC website quite recently. <coughs> um, it's the... Uh, blood and marriage connections of the UK royal family. Um, a family tree tends to be hierarchical. Uh, that's a logical way of, of organizing it. But just like the Star Wars example we saw earlier, you could arrange this um, you know, in a star-shaped or circular shape because it's the same components, right? We've got entities, members of the royal family, and we've got connections between them. Parents to their kids, uh, kids to their grandparents. So we've got the queen up here is obviously connected to her four kids, but through one of them to these grandkids and through both grandkids to different sets of great grandkids. So a family tree is a very recognizable hierarchical uh, type of network. But let's think broader than the royal family because there are lots of different uh, entities. So to use uh, some kind of formal language, uh, we're going to refer to the entities in a network as nodes. So nodes, uh, is a term that comes from network theory, uh, which social network analysis is, um, is draws heavily upon. Um, you may have also heard nodes referred to as actors or agents. So that's a very specific social network analysis uh, term. Um, vertices, vertex, that might be a term you've heard uh, that's from geometry. Uh, or you may have heard of points. So that's from graph theory and mathematics and um, points and lines you know, connected together. For consistency, we're going to say uh, nodes. 
So the things that could and are joined together in a network are known as nodes. And these nodes, as I said, it depends on your research study, individuals, organizations, countries, animals, events, computers, yeah, you name it. Uh, if you can define it sensibly, um, any type of entity can be a node in your network um, analysis. Uh, I read a really interesting paper recently um, by someone who was at Manchester, actually, and it looked at the food sharing network of, I think, jackdaws, so a type of crow, uh, and it was fascinating. So it showed the connections between certain crows, and um, it had the timing, so it showed which crow fed the other one first, and then how long it took for that crow to reciprocate. An incredibly complex, um, rich network from something like 20 crows observed over a week. <laughs> It was absolutely astonishing. So there's a lot of potential. Um, if you can correctly define your nodes and apply social network analysis, uh, it's, it's, it is um, really interesting. So there are different types of nodes uh, in a network. If you have a particular interest in a single node, that tends to be referred to as the ego or the focal node. Um, now, that focal node may emerge from the analysis. So maybe you have no idea who the main player is um, in a network and you do some analysis and you visualize it and suddenly you're like, oh, that person is clearly connected to everybody else or to most other people. That's the main person. But what you tend to find is that a priori, you just define who the ego is. So you may be interested in the 100 largest companies on the UK stock market, for example. So you can say the ego node is the company ranked number one, and then you're interested in how that company is connected to others. Um, or you could say, I'm interested in company number two, uh, for example. So it's up to you um, to define. So if you have an ego or a focal node, then all the other nodes that are immediately around that node are known as alters. So you've got ego is our main focus, alters, um, are the secondary focus. And I'll show you a quick example uh, in a second. And then if we take into account the different ways in which nodes can be connected, um, then we get different um, types and different flavors of nodes. So if you've got two nodes um, that are or could be connected, we call those a dyad. Um, if there are three, um, a triad, and I'm sure these terms are now you know, becoming obvious what they mean. If you have four, it's a tetrad, five, a pentad, six, a hexad, and then I run out. Um, I can't remember what seven um, is. So let's take a, a quick look at what an ego network um, looks like. Um, you've probably seen visualizations like this. You've got a, a keynote in the middle, uh, and then you've got the alters or the secondary nodes that you're interested in um, spread around. So here we have Let's say this is just the CEO of a company or something, or you know the matriarch in a family, or just somebody who is the center of a network. And then you can see who that person is connected to. Uh, and most interestingly as well in an ego network is you're interested in how the alters are connected to each other as well. So you can see that most alters are only connected to the ego but some of them do form little networks uh, of their own um, also. A dyad is very simple. You've got two nodes and they're directly connected. A triad, yeah, like a triangle, three nodes, uh, three connections uh, between uh, these uh, people. And that brings us neatly on to um, our second major building block in a network, which are the connections. So connections are relations, and we're gonna formally call uh, ties uh, in a network. You may have also heard ties called um, links or lines or edges. Uh, we'll see the term edge used as well um, in Python, um, but we're gonna use tie. Tie is a bit of a broader um, term to use and it goes quite well with nodes. So we have nodes uh, and ties in a network. There is a multitude of different types of ties. So just like we can have lots of different nodes, um, those nodes can be connected in whatever ways you can think of in the social world. People can be related through blood, friendships, attending the same, uh, let's say nightclub, to use a COVID-19 example again. Um, people are part of the same gym, live in the same halls, work for the same companies, um, etc. And it's also possible for two entities or two nodes 
to be connected in multiple different ways. So as I said before, you know, two co-workers may also be married um, and may have gone to the same university and go to the same gym and yeah, whatever. Um, so people can be uh, quite densely uh, connected uh, to each other. So the key point is that it's really important to acknowledge that your data will almost certainly only capture a sample of all the possible ties that exist between your nodes. So again, Twitter data, uh, very rich, we'll explore that in two weeks time, but that still only captures the certain ways in which people interact and Twitter accounts interact um, on Twitter. So two Twitter accounts might, you know, retweet each other's content all the time and share links and all this, but they may also be really densely connected outside of Twitter. Maybe those two people actually meet up in the real world, work together, etc. So a data set will not do everything. It'll only show you how people are connected in a limited uh, number of ways. So ties then have two dimensions that help us distinguish um, between them. The first we'll call a numeration or strength of the tie. So firstly, a connection between two nodes can be binary. This simply means people are friends or not, people are married or not, um, companies are you know, in the same industry or not. So we're not interested in how strongly uh, people are connected, just simply are two people connected? Yes, they are, they have a binary um, tie. But if we are interested in the strength of the connection, um, we can have a valued tie. So maybe two people um, are friends, but maybe uh, compared to two other friends, the first group contact each other 20 times last week, while the other group of friends only spoke once very briefly on the phone. So we would say the first pair of friends are more strongly connected than the second, for example. And I realize my words are not visual, but I will show you an example of, of those types um, of ties. So basically a value tie, it can be assigned a numeric weight or a value to show how strong that tie uh, is. And secondly, we have a directionality dimension. So ties can be undirected. So um, I'm married to my wife, that's a binary tie, but it's also undirected. It's not like I married her first or she married me first. There's no flow, there's no direction of the tie. Uh, the tie is just simply there. It didn't originate with me, it didn't originate with her. Um, the tie is undirected. But of course you can have directed ties. So if you donate money to a charity, for example, you're connected to that charity, but the connection began with you donating money. Or in another way, maybe the charity contacted you first, and as a result, you then gave money. So then you'd have the direction going both ways. So there's a tie that exists between you and the organization, um, and there's a, a direction either going from you because you donated first, or they solicited a donation, so therefore the tie originates um, with them. So that's a bit abstract. Best thing, let's look at some um, examples. So let's say we have four people. The four people are um, friends, but some friends contact each other more often than not, uh, exam for example. So let's say we have some undirected and binary uh, ties. So we have our four people, John, Josie, Jane, and Jim. Um, and in the previous week, John spoke to Josie, uh, indicated by the uh, undirected and binary uh, tie here. John also spoke to Jane, um, but he didn't speak to Jim. Similarly, Jim has spoken to Josie and Jane, uh, et cetera. So there's no indication of how strong the ties are uh, and there's no direction. We're not saying that Jane tends to contact John first, um, but we can introduce those elements um, as well. So let's stick with undirected. There's no source of the friendship and uh, two people are connected, but let's try and distinguish uh, the strength of those connections. So these uh, numbers refer to how many times those people contacted each other in the previous week. So Jane spoke to Jim 12 times, Josie spoke to Jim 20 times, hence why that line is, is, is shaded thicker. John spoke to Josie 10 times and John spoke to Jane uh, five times. So again, there's no direction, there's no source of the contact uh, as yet. Two people are connected, but now we can try and distinguish between how strong those connections um, are. 
So let's introduce uh, some directionality. So again, let's just say, are two people connected? But let's say which person tends to initiate contact. So John tends to be the one who initiates contact with Jane, and he's the one who tends to initiate contact um, with uh, Josie. In Jane's case, she tends to initiate contact with Jim. Um, while Jim doesn't initiate contact with anyone, you can see there's no arrow going from Jim. So again, these people are connected, but there's some directionality. John initiates uh, the contact. And again, uh, we can combine these dimensions to create these four types of ties. Here we have a directed and valued tie. So again, who contacts uh, whom first, um, at this time weighted by how many times they've contacted each other. So Jane tends to contact Jim 12 times, um, for example. So far, when we've spoken about connections and ties, we're implicitly meaning direct ties, okay? So two people are directly connected, directly share a relation um, to some extent. So like here, so Jane and John um, are friends. But there are things, uh, there are indirect ties. So Josie is directly connected to Jane. Jane is directly connected to John. But we can say that John is indirectly connected to Josie through Jane. So in you know common kind of parlance, we could say that Josie is a friend of a friend. So John is friends with Jane, Josie is friends with Jane. Therefore, John and Josie, you can say, are mutual acquaintances or share a mutual acquaintance or they're friends uh, of friends. I do really regret using all the J words uh, for names right now. But as a rule of thumb, uh, when you're reading um, books about social network analysis, uh, you're reading papers, you're coming across it. If you see the word connection or tie, you implicitly assume it's a direct connection. People directly share some kind of relation, unless otherwise stated. Um, and if it is otherwise stated, then it's an indirect tie. So people can be friends of friends in a network. And this is what Granovetter in 1973 called you know, weak ties. So kind of mutual acquaintances, people you kind of know through somebody else. Those connections can uh, matter um, also. So we've got direct ties and indirect ties uh, as well. So how are networks represented? So how do we actually store the information and how do we you know, uh, visualize uh, the relational data that we've collected? So networks can be represented using three um, formats. So we've got matrices, we have what are known as edge lists, uh, and we have graphs, which we've seen previously. Um, graphs are also known as sociograms in social network analysis. These are the visualiz visualizations uh, that we've seen previously. So the first uh, and probably most common type uh, of uh, representation is a matrix. Very simple, um, a matrix is an arrangement of elements into rows um, and columns. That sounds a bit abstract, um, but social networks can be represented as matrices um, also. So every row is a node, every column is a node, and then every value indicates whether a tie exists uh, between two nodes um, or not. So let's uh, make these kind of abstract data structures um, concrete. So let's take a small um, but real social network um, as an example. Uh, so my wife is part of a book sharing network uh, with some of her family members and um, she can send some books to uh, other people in the network. She can do that unprompted or maybe someone sends her a book first uh, and then she um, reciprocates. So this is an example of a directed binary network. So the book originates with somebody, somebody initiates the contact by sending a book. Um, but at the moment we're just interested in the binary ties. So if my wife sends somebody a book, they are connected. Not interested in how many books were sent, just the fact that one book was sent means these people um, are connected. So here we can represent this network using a matrix. Um, and again, uh, a social survey, administrative data, data that has rows and columns and cells, which has values for those rows and columns, that's what a matrix is very simply. So if you open up Microsoft Excel, you download one of the large scale social surveys, you know, the, the data is arranged in matrix uh, format. So don't be, um, don't be put off by the word matrix uh, whatsoever. So here's some, this is a real network, but I can't say for certain that these are real 
uh, ties, but I've tried to be as accurate as possible. So here we have my wife, uh, and if we read across the rows, these are the people she sent books to. So my wife is the source uh, of the book, and these people are the receivers. Um, I'm not counting my wife buying a book for herself as a connection, but there are certain instances where people can be connected to themselves. Um, and we'll explore examples later. So my wife didn't send her aunt a book. She sent her cousin one, didn't send her girl. Look at my cousin. You can see she sent my wife uh, four books and sent her grand some books, um, etc. So if you wanted to calculate how many books my wife sent to others in total, it's really easy if the data are in matrix format. We can just find my wife on the row and sum across, and we can see that in total, my wife sent three books. If we wanted to know how many she received, again, um, the receivers are the targets of the ties uh, are on the columns. So if we read down, you can see that my wife received 10 books. So she sent three uh, and received um, 10. So storing network data in a matrix, it's not just useful for storage or you know it's recognizable, um, it's necessary for actually doing lots of calculations in social network um, analysis. And again, this is an adjacency uh, matrix. Again, an edge list is a very simple um, kind of uh, relation or extension of a, of a matrix. It takes all the information we have in the matrix and it just has a list of all the connections that exist. So we can see from previously that my wife sent her cousin uh, two books. So that um, tie exists. So my wife was the source, the cousin was the target, and the weight uh, is two. So my wife sent the cousin two books. Uh, my wife sent my sister, etc. and we can read down. So in an edge list, it's simply a list of all the ties that exist in a network, uh, and the ties are represented as pairs of nodes. And again, this data exists in a spreadsheet, and uh, you'll see that when we go through uh, some of the data examples. Uh, later on and in the rest of the lessons. And third and finally, before we get to our analysis, uh, we can also represent networks as graphs or sociograms. A uh, graph is a very uh, formal uh, thing in graph theory. So in mathematics, a graph is a set of lines connecting uh, points. So that's why in social network uh, visualizations that the nodes are represented as circles. So it's just, you know, um, it goes back to graph theory, and um, points are connected um, by lines. Hahnemann and Riddle uh, provide some really good um, advice and clarity on using um, graphs and sociograms for networks. So you represent the nodes as circles, and um, you represent the ties as lines, uh, and you use arrow heads if the tie um, is directed. And then you can use you know things like colors and shapes and sizes to differentiate nodes. Um, by their attributes or their network uh, characteristics. So if you think back to the Star Wars example we had, um, some of the characters, their circles were bigger, and um, the circles were bigger if that character appeared in lots of scenes, and the circles were small if a character um, appeared in, say, one scene across six movies, uh, for example. And you can also use the same um, techniques to uh, differentiate the ties themselves. So if you think back previously to our the four uh, examples I gave of the friendship network, um, you can make the lines thicker uh, to show that some ties are stronger between individuals. You can use different color lines if there are different types of ties between two people, um, et cetera. Uh, so this is an example of how we could visualize um, a social network. So this is a real network, but there are fictional ties. So any music fans, this is Bruce Springsteen's band, the E Street Band. These are the current members, and I've just made up the fact that some people like each other uh, and don't. So I've made it up that Bruce likes Roy, Bruce likes uh, Max, who I think is a keyboardist, uh, Bruce likes his wife, which is obvious, and Bruce likes Stevie Van Zandt, for example. Um, but you can see there's no connection between Bruce and uh, the saxophonist, for example. Uh, so we've got nodes represented by circles, they're all the same type of node, member of the band, so I haven't colored the nodes. But for example, I could you know, use color coding to differentiate between different age groups or different sexes, for example. Uh, and I've made up that poor Gary here is, isn't connected to anybody. Nobody likes um, him. 
So this is an example of how we can very sensibly uh, visualize um, a social network. Or if we think back to the, the, the real network that my wife is part of, um, these are you know, the ties that exist. So you can see there's a reciprocal uh, directed tie between my wife and my sister because they've both sent each other books. Um, you can see that my aunt has sent my wife a book, so a connection exists, but my wife hasn't sent one back in return, hence why there's no arrowhead um, here. So visualization can be really um, appealing, it can be really powerful. You've probably noticed that unless it's a very, very small network, visualization gets very, very uh, messy as we're about to see. So if you're going to do social network analysis, <coughs> excuse me, focus on the numbers, focus on producing numeric measures and calculations of network properties and leave visualization either to the very beginning or to the very end. It's not a, it's not a crucial, it's not a necessary activity um, with social network analysis, but it is appealing and it can be quite nice. So let's end uh, with a quick um, analysis for five minutes. So I have a research question, um, <coughs> excuse me. So what degree of board interlock occurs in the UK charity sector? So board interlock is a, a kind of long uh, running phenomenon of interest um, in organizational sociology. It's the degree to which organizations are connected through shared board members. So if I you know, act as the director of company A and the director of company B, we can say that company A and company B um, are connected. So if you think back to our approach, next I need to define the nodes and connections. So I'm interested in registered charities. These are organizations that have charity status and are regulated um, by the Charity Commission. Uh, and the connection I'm interested in is that they share a trustee uh, in common. Obviously charities can be connected in lots of different ways. They can share office space, you know, they can uh, lobby the government you know, together. They can be connected in lots of ways. Um, but I'm just interested in one way, which is sharing board members. Is there a data set I can get my hands on? Yes, there is. There are current trustees um, of charities uh, who are headquartered in Manchester. So there's open data I can get. Uh, and then in terms of analysis, you know, uh, how big is the network? How cohesive is the network? Uh, and which charities are the best connected uh, in that network um, as well? So let's switch to the live code demonstration. Uh, people have probably seen this before if you're a, return, a returnee. Um, I'll explain what a Jupyter Notebook is later on or at a different time, uh, but it allows us to mix code, narrative, um, and results all in the same uh, document. So let's go to our example. So we want to do this analysis in Python. Um, so there's a couple of preliminary steps. Um, this notebook is available to you where it explains exactly what's going on. So for now, I'm just gonna focus on um, the output. So I won't spend time explaining the individual uh, lines of code, but I can do that maybe um, either later or I can do it as part of a different uh, training series if you'd like. So we begin with um, data on the current trustees uh, of a group of Manchester charities. So you can see what that looks like. Um, so we have a data set with 2,700 uh, individuals, uh, well, 2,700 observations and four variables. Uh, here's an example, so we've got a person here. Uh, again, this is real data and it's open data, so hence um, why I can use the person's name. So uh, Rabi here uh, is on the board of three charities um, and here's the unique ID of each uh, organization. So this is what we would call attributional data. It's a data set of trustees, and for each trustee, we capture some basic uh, information, their name, how many trusteeships, and who they're connected to. Because we have this variable here, that pro provides relational data um, on charities in Manchester. So because this person is on the board of these three organizations, we can see that charity 101, et cetera, this one and this one are all connected. So these ones are connected through their board. So already we have three charities that we know are connected to, to each other uh, through a common um, trustee. So the first task in any of these social network analysis um, workflows is to extract that relational information. And at the end, uh, we'll get um, an adjacency matrix. So as you can see before, 
every row is a node and every column is a node as well. Hence, that's why we call it a node by node matrix. And the ties that exist between charities are undirected and binary. So simply, does a charity share a trustee with another? That's all we're interested in. We're not interested in how many trustees, just simply that there is a connection. <clears throat> and I don't think it makes much sense to say that the connection originates with one charity. If we had better information, then we would know when a trustee um, first joined the board of a charity, and then that might allow us to introduce you know, a direction. So I start on the board of company A, and then two years later, I join the, the board of company B, for example. But we're ignoring that, we're keeping it simple. We're interested in the binary undirected um, ties. So I want a network of charities. I've got 1,123 uh, organizations. So I'll have 1,123 rows and 1,123 uh, columns. So we can use some clever Python code to create our adjacency matrix. <clears throat> and as you can see here, every row is a charity and every column a charity also. And the values are the cells in this matrix tell us whether these uh, charities are connected. Um, Again, you know, we don't count uh, a charity being connected to itself. That doesn't make any sense in this context. Um, but for this first charity here, we can see they're not connected, not connected, um, et cetera. Uh, but quite a few of them um, are. So you could probably predict there's lots of zeros. Most charities are not connected to most other um, charities. But actually in this network, they're all connected to at least one other, which is quite interesting. So as I showed earlier, you can sum the rows or you can sum the columns to find out how many connections a given charity um, has. So if we execute this code here, um, we can see that on average, uh, a charity is connected to uh, three other organizations. Uh, if we use the mean, uh, if we use the median, um, typically a charity is connected to two other organizations. But there's at least one charity that's connected to 23 others. Now that's quite interesting that, you know, these are current trustees. These are not, you know, historical data. So there is some charity in Manchester connected to 23 um, others, which is quite interesting. And we're going to find out uh, who that is. <clears throat> so the final thing we do before I produce some results is we take that matrix, we plug it into a module called networks in Python. Networks is basically a library of methods and measures and calculations we can use uh, to work with um, network uh, data. Yep, so basically we take our charity matrix, uh, we put it into um, a network uh, object. Oops. We can forget all that for now, we can learn that um, at a different time. So let's start summarizing the network. So let's get a sense of how big the network is in terms of nodes and ties. So we can print some uh, information about the network. So we can see that there are 1,123 nodes. We knew that you know, from previously, um, but now we know how many connections there are. So Python calls it edges, um, but we are gonna call it uh, ties or connections. So these 1,100 charities have about 1,500 connections um, between them. So not a lot of connections uh, in this network. Um, I won't do the maths in front of you, but there should there's the potential for around 500,000 connections. So if every charity was connected to every other, we'd expect there to be about 500,000 um, ties, but there aren't. So there's only about 0.003 of a percent um, of ties um, that have actually been realized uh, in the network. And on average, a charity has three um, connections. So we saw that previously. So the first question we can ask is how cohesive or dense is this network? So how many possible connections between charities um, have been realized? So we've got a measure that ranges from between one, meaning every single connection between every single charity is present, um, or zero, meaning no charity manages to connect to anybody else. The real answer obviously falls between zero and one in the real, uh, in the real world, uh, and often very, very close um, to zero. So in our network, as I said, yep, nearly about 0.003 of a percent. Um, so very few charities actually manage to form connections uh, in the network. <clears throat> we can also ask ourselves about clustering. So to what extent do nodes form little groups together? Um, put another way, 
do nodes tend to form triads? So do we get groups of three charities all connecting uh, to each other? So we get lots of local clusters, basically, um, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so transitivity is one such measure. Basically, we take the potential for um, triads and we see how many triads actually um, formed. It's much easier to just um, show you this. So a potential triad is a situation that looks like this. So we've got three nodes and two connections exist between the nodes, but this one is missing right here. So these two people, again, uh, have a mutual acquaintance, but they don't actually know each other. So that's a potential triad. What we really want to see is a realized, so an actual triad. Um, and basically the transitivity measure um, tells us the ratio of these, um, oops, uh, the ratio of the realized triads uh, to potential triads. So we can calculate that really quickly. Um, we get uh, a figure here, so we get 61%. So basically um, when there are three nodes and there are two connections between those nodes. About 60% of the time, those other two nodes manage to connect uh, together uh, to each other. So transitivity is a good measure of, you know, a friend of a friend actually becoming a friend, um, if that makes uh, sense. I'll explain all these in webinar three. This is just to give you a taste, don't worry. Um, so finally, we have some node level measures um, as well. So which nodes possess the most connections? That's an interesting question. Um, that's called centrality. So which charities have the most connections um, in the network? So if we take a charity, uh, not quite at random, but we'll take charity 225116, um, it has 12 connections. So it's connected to 12 other um, charities. We could look at the top 20. So this charity here is the one that has 23 connections. This one has 22 and there's a big group have 12 connections um, also. <clears throat> and we can visualize those connections using a histogram uh, also. So the vast majority of charities in our network have one or two connections. About 100 have two or three connections. You know, about 50 have more than five connections, um, et cetera, uh, as well. <clears throat> And finally, because I know you'll, you'll want to see this, um, but it'll prove my point, visualizing a network is not essential, but nevertheless, here is the charity um, trustee network. Uh, so you can see there's a big kind of cluster in the middle, <clears throat> lots of organizations around it, and then on the periphery, uh, lots of charities that don't have many um, <clears throat> connections. To prove my point, here's the exact same data using just a different drawing. Uh, this is the exact same network, um, but this time I've just arranged the nodes in a circle around the side, uh, and here are all the connections between uh, the nodes. So as you can see, <clears throat> visualization, unless it's an incredibly small and simple network, it just really isn't that revealing. 